with that kid. His head don't work, it never did. You better not cross his path. He's a chain smoking alcoholic, so he'll pass. Kevin wasn't allowed to smoke in Mr. Franklin's office anymore because he kept burning holes in the couch and trying to set the room on fire. Call me curious, Kevin. Kevin decided to call him something else. Mr. Franklin didn't like being called names, but he let it go because he didn't like getting hit a whole lot more. Howdy, Kevin. Wreck the couch. Were there any experiences in your childhood that made you glad to be Kevin Spencer? Kevin's mom and dad threw a surprise party for his 15th birthday. The biggest surprise was that Kevin had already been 15 for seven months, but because he'd been locked up in juvenile detention, they said it was the first time they could all get together. Kevin had written his parents from solitary asking for some gloves and a crossbow, but instead they decided to give him nothing because they'd spent all their money on Richie Starr's motivational videotapes. The tapes worked because Percy was so motivated, he drank, smoked, and weighed almost three times as much as he did since the last time Kevin had seen him. Happy birthday, boy. Have one of Daddy's smokes. Oh, wait, it's my last one. Never mind. Catch you next year. You can have first sip, Kevin. Kevin's dad gave him all the birthday cards he'd received from relatives. We opened them all, but there weren't no money. Honest. Kevin was pretty unhappy, but then he got to thinking that no matter what they got him for his birthday, he would have pawned it to buy smokes and cough syrup anyway, so this just cut out the middle man. Mama wants to dance, boy. Jesus ain't sugar plum. You're the apple of my damn eye, you are. Tell Mama you love her. Come on, Kevin, sweetie. Tell Mama. <laughs> She holds her booze worse than her mother. Come on, boy. Let me and you paint this son of a bitch town red. You gotta drive on account of my suspension. Before they left, they stole all of Mum's cigarettes and the $17 she had in her purse. Kevin was pretty excited. He hadn't been out drinking with his dad for almost two years because their jail time never coincided. Up your gap and a-hole. $17 sure doesn't go too far. Kevin wished his parents had jobs so they could have afforded to drink more, but that probably wasn't gonna happen. Not too many people wanna hire ex-convicts. Not many except for retirement homes and some cruise lines. Kevin figured they were gonna have to call it a night. I got an idea, boy. Let's you and me go find a corner store and steal all the lottery tickets. You get the car while I go in and straighten things out with that no good jack hump son of a bitch bouncer what just excluded us. Hit it, boy! Give me two cartons of smoke, some cough syrup. What kind do you like, boy? Some porno magazines, don't matter which ones. And a lottery ticket. You can't aim worth a damn, boy. Here, you scratch some while I show you how it's done. Here, see if you can't flatten the bastard's tires. I got some scratching to do. Jesus, eight, I'm a millionaire. Give me the gun, boy. Let's have that bottle. I aim to do some celebrating. <laughs> Don't tell your old lady nothing about the dough. Soon Kevin's dad was passed out colder than a trailer hitch enema. The old man would be asleep for a few hours, so Kevin figured he'd have plenty of time to cash the ticket and stiff the ignorant son of a bitch for his share. 
After all, the closest the old man ever got to a million dollars was junk mail from Ed McMahon. A million dollars sure was a lot of money. Kevin didn't want to be stupid and waste it all, so he took almost a whole week to spend it. It was the nicest house Kevin had ever been in, even counting the ones he'd robbed. And he had enough money left over to buy a Rolls Royce and to fill the whole barn up with cough syrup and smokes. Kevin didn't tell his parents where he was living because they were unemployed freeloaders. Kevin figured from now on, people would like him and he would fit in. Six months later, Kevin was down to his last bottle of cough syrup and he had only half a pack of cigarettes left. So instead of thinking about getting a job, he traded the house and the car for a Texas Mickey Awry and three cartons of menthol cigarettes. Pleasure doing business with you, son. Now get the hell off my land. Kevin didn't much like getting talked to like that, so before he left, he set the house on fire and busted out all the glass things on the car. He figured that ought to straighten things out. Kevin figured his old man would be plenty angry at him for screwing him out of a million dollars, so he was pretty nervous about going home. Hey, boy, give me a drink while you're up. What's doing, Kev? Kevin breathed a big sigh of relief. Charlie only came around to see his mom when the old man was in prison, so Kevin figured he'd be all right for a little while anyway. Oh. Kevin's parents wanted to get rid of him for a few weeks, so they sent him to the cheapest summer camp they could find. Welcome to two weeks of hell, losers. This year's Nurse Jenkins. If you get hurt, try and find her. The cabins are over there. And this year's Karen something or other. She's another counselor working on some dorky co-op thing. Hiya, gang. I just know we're going to have tons of fun and become really great friends. Yeah, whatever. Uh, and there's four boats by the water. Two of them sink real easy. Uh, I can't remember which two, but that pretty much clears itself up on its own. And this here's my girlfriend, Wendy. Uh, we'll be in our cabin most of the time, so leave us the hell alone. Unless, of course, someone's doing something I can get sued over. Now, uh, go find something to do. Okay, troopers. Let's put our stuff away in the cabins, and then we'll all meet back here for arts and crafts. Kevin's parents had forgotten to pack a bag for him, so he figured he'd just hang around and have a few smokes until the other kids got back. <laughs> Kevin sat under a big tree and watched Karen. Kevin was kind of scared all alone at camp, but then something occurred to him. No one at the camp knew Kevin, so he figured if he behaved himself and tried really hard to be friendly, then he would fit in and people would like him. You guys are all so talented. Hey, Billy, what are you making? It's a wallet to keep my allowance money in. I'm saving up for college. How about you, Amber? What are you making? I made this purse. I'm going to send it to my mom. She's going to love it. You must have a great mom, because she raised a great kid. Hey, Kevin, what are you working on there? Kevin stood up and showed everyone the holster he was making. He told them it was for the gun he'd stolen from his neighbor's house. Oh, uh, uh, I know. Let's break for lunch. Everyone go wash up. Kevin, can I talk to you for a minute? So you see, Kevin, that's why the other kids were put off. Guns scare them. So do people who have guns. Now, I know you want to make friends and have a good time. So why don't we clean the slate? Starting right after lunch, we'll begin to try and make the other kids less afraid of you. Hey, lunatic, why don't you kiss her? Kevin was about to kiss Karen when some of the other kids showed up. Kevin wasn't too happy about that, and he really wanted to hit someone, but he didn't want Karen to think he was wrong in the head. 
so Kevin figured he'd wait until she wasn't looking. Kevin got bored with waiting, so he pointed to the woods and screamed, Bear! Everyone turned around to look. The boy standing next to Kevin never saw it coming. Karen! The gun kid punched me in the head! Kevin had some time to think during his two-hour time out, and he decided that what he had done was wrong. Next time, he'd go ahead and hit the kid without waiting for Karen to turn around, because he figured he'd get caught either way, and the way Kevin had things figured, the sooner he got caught, the sooner his time out would be over. That's good thinking, boy. Now let's smoke. They had a big campfire that night, and everyone sang songs and took turns telling jokes. Hey, Kevin. Do you have a joke that you'd like to tell? Kevin was really scared. He didn't like speaking in front of other people, but because he wanted everyone to like him, he decided he would try his best. Kevin stood up and told a joke he'd overheard his father telling Uncle Mike about how many lesbians it took to change a light bulb. That pretty much set the tone for the rest of camp. It was the night before parents' day, and Kevin was alone in his cabin because all the other kids had moved to the other cabins because they were afraid to sleep in the same room as Kevin. That suited Kevin just fine because he was getting pretty sick of listening to them complain about his smoking and drinking. Kevin couldn't sleep, so he decided to go over to Karen's cabin and see if she would go steady with him. He was having a hard time getting there because he was pretty jimmied up on cough syrup and kept falling down. The last time he fell, he rolled down a little hill and ended up on the beach right beside Karen. She was making out with Frankie. Kevin told Frankie to get his hands the hell off his girl. Frankie and Karen just laughed. Then Frankie told him to take a hike and called him a useless little freak. Kevin wandered back to his cabin. He was really sad because he'd been sure Karen liked him and it hurt a whole lot finding out she didn't. So Kevin set her cabin on fire. He figured that ought to straighten things out. He was going to use the fire to light a smoke, but then he realized he was all out. It was parents' day, and Kevin was real jumpy from nicotine withdrawal. He hoped his parents would get there soon so he could bum a smoke from his mom. By about noon, Kevin was beginning to wonder if his parents were gonna bother coming at all. He was pretty testy, and all the other kids and their parents pretty much left him alone. Kevin was just about to give up hope when a taxi pulled in. I got no money, so F off! Where's my sugar? Yeah, boy, come and see Mama. Where's my boy, damn it? Jesus, look out! He's in the little smoke! You leave him be! He's just a boy! Shut your trap, cow! F yours, convict! You got a problem here, and I'll fix it for you. The only problem I got is I'm married to an impotent son of a bitch! You just cross the line, fatty! Come on, boy! Let's get some lunch! Yeah, I didn't figure you'd make too many friends. They all look like a bunch of knobs anyhow. So screw them! <laughs> What's the matter? You ain't never heard a lady pass gas? Mama's got a tinkle. Go steal the nurse's car and meet over by the outhouse. I wants to get going so I don't miss Springer. Why, Jesus, we forgot about your father. <laughs> Any of you a 
a-holes gotta smoke? I was going through your files again last night, Kevin. When I stumbled across this marriage certificate, I think your attempt at establishing a nuclear family of your own is extremely relevant. In terms of our understanding of the influence your parents' marriage had on your development. I think it would aid our efforts to fix your brain if we dissect the underlying issues of your attempt at holy matrimony. What do you think? Kevin was 16 years old, and he'd just been released from juvenile detention. Kevin was really happy to be free, so he decided to celebrate by getting bent out of shape on cough syrup. He didn't have any money, though, but he figured that's what shoplifting was for. It had taken Kevin almost seven hours to violate his parole. He was pretty proud of himself, because that was a record for him. Kevin didn't much feel like going home, so he figured he'd wander around downtown a little bit and maybe break into a store or two. About halfway through filling up a bag full of new releases, Kevin remembered that his mom had pawned the VCR to get a tattoo of David Hasselhoff put on her ass. That meant that Kevin would have to steal a VCR too. That sounded a whole lot like work to him, so Kevin figured he'd just break into the store anytime he wanted to watch a movie. <laughs> Maybe it was just the cough syrup talking, but Kevin sure liked the idea of marrying a prostitute. So he figured he'd clean out the till, steal a car, and go find a hooker. He'd heard that you could get married in Mexico without your parents' consent. So the way Kevin saw things, it was pretty much a perfect plan. Hurry up, you broken headed freak. The cops are gonna be looking for the cop. Now how about her? Hey, see pretty. Come on, just pick one. Marriage was a pretty big step, and Kevin didn't want to rush things. He was almost ready to give up when he saw her. What you in the mood for, lover? Kevin told her he wanted to take her to Mexico and marry her. The hooker wasn't too big on getting hitched, but Mexico sure sounded nice, and she figured Kevin was good for the cash because he'd been able to afford such an expensive car. As hookers go, she wasn't one of the smarter ones. unemployed son of a bitch! Kevin didn't have much money left, and he wasn't about to share it. So he pretended to be asleep for the next three hours until his wife got really bored and angry and left. That was okay by Kevin, because married life hadn't been much fun since he'd come down off the cough syrup. Ladies at the beach turning tricks for drinks and smokes. She took me for half a pack, but I guess you knew that, being omnipresent and what have you. I've been following you since you got out of juvie on account of you being the lord and all. You want to get some food? Kevin hadn't expected to see his multiple personality psychotic best friend in Mexico, but he was glad he was there. There were a lot of scary looking people around, and Kevin was nervous. Besides, Pete always had plenty of smokes. Sure, she's nice and all, and good looking too. Not saying that, it's just that, well, I figured you being who you are, you could have gotten just about any girl. Hey, Pedro, the son of God wants another margarita. Kevin was bored just sitting around with Pete, so he asked him for 50 bucks then told him to go smite some infidels for a few hours. Kevin figured that ought to straighten things out. It had been a long time since Kevin had his hands on that kind of money, so he decided to celebrate by getting a big tattoo on his back. Hey, 
senor. I put a naked lady on you. Big breasts on her, with a sword and a unicorn. Just like a van. How about for you? Kevin didn't like any of the pictures. He was about to leave when he spotted a sign on the telephone pole outside of the tattoo parlor. It was the toughest and meanest looking dog Kevin had ever seen, and he figured people would think he was really cool and want to hang out with him if he had it tattooed on his back. By the time Kevin found out that the man working at the tattoo parlor didn't understand English real well, it was too late. Kevin wasn't too happy, so he hit the man right across the back of the head with a chair and knocked him out cold. Then Kevin took off the man's shirt and tattooed I'm a big dumb fag on his stomach. He figured that ought to learn the ignorant prick a thing or two. Just a minute, boss. Thanks for letting me spite them, folks. Kevin had had his fill of Mexico and married life. Things hadn't quite worked out the way he thought they would, so he decided that if he ever got the chance, he'd kick the sweet holy hell out of the guy who wrote Pretty Woman. Slappy Bigelow had violated his parole and was back in prison. He was Kevin's arch nemesis because Kevin had taken over control of the prison's black market trade by having Pete give the bastard a real good once over. Slappy told everyone that he was going to return the favor. Normally, Kevin would have just commanded Pete to take care of it, but Pete was in the psychiatric ward because he thought he was a 1957 John Deere tractor. Kevin figured it'd be best to just stay out of Slappy's way until Pete's medication kicked in and he came back. Slappy had other plans. That's the stupidest tattoo I've ever seen. Run, you twisted little thacko! Kevin took off as fast as he could, but he slipped on the wet floor and fell back and cracked his head. Slappy wasn't too happy, because he'd really been looking forward to hitting Kevin with the t-shirt full of soap bars. Then Slappy got to thinking. Just because Kevin was out cold, there was no reason he couldn't bust him a few real stiff ones across the head anyway, just for kicks. 